Let's drink beer It makes my mind clear It takes me away from here Let's drink beer Let's drink beer Pop the top, lift it up, drink it up So what are we drinking now? Let's crack something. I feel like you guys have been drinking beer all day. You gotta, I mean, you gotta have some wine, right? Yeah, that's absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this is what we wanna know. We, we need to, we need to like see the, the other side. Well, I stuck, right. I stuck with bubbles because I know you guys are like carbonation heads. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, I saved like a warm bottle of champagne open so I exploded on everybody. <laughs> like that's the wine expert from Wine End. Yeah. yeah, that's me, that's me. Yeah, you guys have been drinking beer all day. I figured I might as well bring some it's good It's a palate champagne. cleanser, right? Yeah, yeah. A little intermezzo. So yeah. what, it, what, is, what, it, what, are, what is this you're popping? This is Pierre Jumonet's 2012 Cuvée Gastronomy. Um, a mouth full of words just to say it's really, really rad stuff. Yeah. So is there a certain way to open a bottle of champagne? Are you supposed to hear that? Or is that sort of, no, no, no. no. You know, it's, it's crazy. Like 24 people a year die from cork related deaths. Really? Yeah, I promise. No. That's a real stat, bro. <laughs> Look it up. 10 years Look ago, it, it used to be 90. They get hit in the, I mean, they, society is old. Where do they get hit to things. die from it? It's gotta be like Temple, yeah. It's like <laughs> one in a million. But no, I'm telling you, like, this is like, champagne safety is super important. Yeah. But are you supposed to hear that pop, or is that, is that, is a that do bit. something? Are you calling me out of my sloppy no, champagne? No, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering I'm because tip. I like, like, is that a, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, you want, you want like as little pop as possible. Why is that? You still want it to be a little audible. How come? A hiss right. is what you're, you're trying to, a hiss and a slight I pop. I heard the hiss. An angel's yeah. fart yeah. is what you're doing. <laughs> uh, but why is that? What is it, does it do something? If you like pop it or shake it too much and, you know, the reason you buy champagne is because of bubbles, right? right? I mean, so you. Oh, let too much bubbles. Yeah, the, exactly. The carbon dioxide. Does but this particular blend, it's called Cuvée Gastronomy because it's made with like lower pressure and softer bubbles, so it's really easy to drink with food, like gastronomy, gastronomy wine. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's supposed wow. to be like softer. Cheers. 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 So that hiss you heard was me yeah. messing up really badly. Oh, that was the angel's <laughs> fart, right? So in beer, it's the or in beer and whiskey, it's the angel's share, right? Okay, you know, Champagne, it's the angel's fart. The angel's fart. Okay. You're welcome for bringing the best thing you had all day. Just jokes, my dude. That is pretty damn good, though. See, but like you, you taste something like this, and then you go back to some of like the the more well-crafted sour beers. Yeah. And there's 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 characteristics that go back and forth, and I think you kind of pointed out like sometimes if you're trying to get like a wine drinker into certain beers, and you give them these certain sour beers, there's a lot of relatable characteristics. They call it Venus. Yeah. It's so Venus, dude. It's so like wine-like. You know, that's why what I brought is like only sour beers because I'm the wine guy, right? But I, I, you know, I love beer flavored beers, but yeah. sour beers are like my jam. It looks like you. Oh yeah, yeah. No, this is delicious. <laughs> well, let's try to get back up with. Right. And that's the really cool thing that's happened is people realize like, okay, I can't, it's not, it's not a goose if I don't make it in Belgium, but it's still, I can make a wild ale somewhere else. It's just going to taste different because yeah. the, the flora in the air is going to be different. You know? Do you think people can um, like kind of doctor what type of yeast they want like wild for like by planting, you know, a ridge? So is this, is this um, you think they figured out? wood age? Are, there, are these aged in wood barrels no. or stainless? Yeah, wow. which is crazy, yeah, but it brings that like, it gets the mouthfeel and complexity because of lees. Mm. And it's not really appetizing to talk about, but it's like dead yeast cells basically. Yeah. But that's the hallmark for champagne. That's like, that's what people pay for. You pay for really high acid right. and like really funky yeasty things. But that, and I think that transfers the same thing with like certain sour beers. It's like yeah. without that yeast characteristic and those lees, like it's not the same yeah. characteristics. There's so much interesting flavor that comes from that. It's like terroir, right? Like, yeah. is there terroir in beer? Like hundred percent, dude, hundred percent. Like, can you make anything that Cantillon makes outside of the Zen River Valley? Like. No, you, you can't do it unless it's made in that specific right. place. Wine, Everything. beer, kimchi, how much yogurt, kimchi, yeah. question, how much time man. people... We should do a blind tasting on that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call Bill. Coors <laughs> yeah. Light was like, so I love Coors Light. Coors Light bucket ice, you know, I mean, you drink... I, I drink Coors Light all the time. You, you drink it up with me. Like, yeah, like, so that's my pop's beer. Yeah. So it's like super nostalgic and I will always drink Coors Light bucket ice. See, and that's, I think that's the cool thing as we've gone through all of this is like everybody is, yeah, there you got the Coors Light, see? <laughs> Where's the bucket ice? Yeah, there's a bucket of ice. What kind of service is this? But I think, it, I think it's demystifying things because at, at some point things have gotten so where it's like, it's, oh, you, you can't enjoy that. 
right? Because people have told you like, oh, that you can't enjoy that. Don't you have a good palate? Right, but it's like you know what you so enjoy what I, you want to enjoy, right? You know, it's like what makes you happy, and and you can be happy with this, which is like totally unbelievable. But then that's still like it's gonna make you happy, and it's like well made. Hundred percent, dude. Sometimes it makes me happier. <laughs> Because I need like ten of those, yeah. And this is like this is not like a Tuesday bottle, right? Yeah, this is two, three cans of happiness, and you know, there you go. And sometimes it's just four, or five, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> two, three is appetizer for you, bro. I see you. Three, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, two, three at a time. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're gonna get back to drinking more of this amazing champagne and jumping into some of the amazing sour beers that we brought after the break. Cheers. Cheers. Bringing you what matters. Viewers can receive the Star Advertiser digital full access subscription for just $9.95 per month. Go to StarAdvertiser.com and click on subscribe. Use the code AHI THING. Hey guys, welcome back to The Art of Beer. We are here with Chris from Elb and we are um, finally going to start drinking some beer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't act like you're so upset. <laughs> you, you like I am mad. <laughs> so what are we drinking? Let's crack those two. Let's get the Dre Fontaine open and the Canty on. So we're kind of spoiling ourselves on this episode with some really special Belgian lambics, which, <laughs> you know, these beers, unfortunately, like not super easy to find, you know, um, they, they're hard to make. They don't produce a lot. We unfortunately don't get a lot to Hawaii when we do and you find them and people buy them, but they're exquisite. And I think, you know, the reason we're drinking them with, with, with Chris is because they're, the, they're as close to as wine production as you're going to get in the beer world. And when, when we talk about terroir, I mean, these are made in that same kind of ideal, right? Like you can't, these both beers are made in a specific region in Belgium where the air, it's, it's all about what, what comes through the air, right? Without what's going through the air, you, you're not, you know, the, the microbes and the, the open ferment. So these beers are brewed and they're allowed to sit open and whatever falls into those vats and starts fermenting them, that's the wild, that's the wild yeast and the wild flora that goes into it and that's going to produce all the flavors. And then from there, they're put into oak barrels and they're carefully aged for one, two and three years. Um, and it's, it's, you know, no different than how like a, a really like artisanal art, white winemaker is going to make wine. They're washing barrels, they're tasting things throughout the years. And what's beautiful is, you know, like with, with the Dre Fontaine, this is a blend of a one, two and three year goose. Um, and then with the, the Cantillon Creek, you know, you have cherries at it. You know, Creek is cherry. And you it's, smell that? Yeah, it's just, you, got, you get so much characteristics through it. Oh, I wish I didn't bring it for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pour it back? And, what, I wish I and, did. and wait, wait, so, so how, how <laughs> what, what, year, what year was this bottle, the so Cantillon? This, this is uh, 2014. 2014. Thanksgiving 2014. And it's 2021. Um, wow, that's great. And we're cracking great. it, and it's still... But it's not to say like so whatever Exquisite. yeast falls in the in the vat. That's not to say like it's just any kind. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's like competitive selections. Like for centuries, this, this yeast has like shown itself to be like the best for making this style of beer. And like I don't know, I've never been, and I my trip got canceled to go. Mm. But my friends tell me like, like, have you been? Yes. There's like, is there two like there's spider webs in the corner? And oh stuff, yeah, absolutely. And like, yeah, yeah. And they don't they don't knock down the spider webs. They don't clean the mold on the walls. Because that's Cause what makes the beer. Yes, exactly. I mean, both both in Cantillon and everywhere else in the Pajori land, which is all in that Seine River Valley, um, it's all part of the flora, right? And it's it's without that, it's they're they're afraid and they won't move because if you move in the building, the building has life. It's it's and that's the thing. It's, there's life that's growing around you. That's part of nature that you can't replace. Um, and you can do these type of beers in other places. They're just going to taste different. Right. And that's the really cool thing that's happened is people realize like, okay, I can't, it's not, it's not a goose if I don't make it in Belgium, but it's still, I can make a wild ale somewhere else. It's just going to be taste different because the, the flora in the air is going to be different. You know? Do you think people can um, like kind of doctor what type of yeast they want, like wild 
for like by planting, you know, a ridge full of this type of tree. Right? Do you think they figured out what they can add to their environment to add certain types of yeast that they like? Yeah, I think you know. I think I, I don't know about in the wine world, but I know in the beer world, like, yeah, they they plant orchards around certain right. areas, and that's that's sort of interesting. Like they plant cherry trees, or they plant like peach trees, or whatnot. I don't know if that happens in the, in yeah, the wine. Yeah, I mean, world. it's it's either like it's wild or it's like lab, Control, right? right? But I think there's a there's a push for like semi, right. you know, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But it, it's, yeah, yeast and they're such our such our good friends. <laughs> the things we can't see that make they're alcohol, right? right? Yeah, like, they're invisible, and, and no one no one understood until like 150 years ago. Yeah, and people that drink don't realize how important yeast is and how much work. <laughs> whether you're making, you know, it's. Like tequila, wine, Everything. beer, Kim how much yogurt, <laughs> kimchi. Yeah. How much time people put into studying what kind of yeast they're using? So. Yeah, and it makes everything that's delicious is made, <laughs> a lot of stuff is made by yeast, even dry aged steak. <laughs> Seriously, I'm um, speaking of delicious things. Why don't you guys take a break, go grab something delicious, and join us back in a couple minutes for more of the art of beer. The art of beer is brought to you by Growler Hawaii. 100 taps of great beer and other beverages. Stop in for some drink, food, and fun. Growler Hawaii, located at 449 Kapahulu. We're back at the Art of Beer with Chris, and he's definitely spoiling us with a lot of treats. So let's get into the next one. Let's crack that uh, Russian River. That's the one. So Chris, come on, you brought I this brought, I brought yes. it because I want you to talk story about it. I know. I, <laughs> I want you to, yeah. Okay, so some of these beers we're trying in this episode Unfortunately, you're not gonna find. Like, you know, it's it. The the Cantillon or the Dre Fontaines, and for this matter, Consecration from Russian River. Like, unless you go to the source, you, you you're not gonna find. But again, that's that's part of the the fun of of you know, like loving beer, seeking things out. It's sometimes a rarity of things. Yeah, is so fun to try and find and seek out and then save and then share, right? Like, I think that's a quality of, of sharing things is amazing, right? Like, well, I went to a trip uh, to visit Russian River and you know, it's like the Mecca, right? It's for every single beer lover, like you gotta go visit. And I was, flight got delayed, was there for like barely last call. And you know, I'm a restaurant guy. I didn't wanna like irritate them. So I called him before and I was like, hey, I'm gonna be a little late, but can I can I go into the bar? I'm gonna I want to taste every single beer you have on tap, and it was like the worst possible experience I could have had hospitality-wise. Like apparently this guy had just had a kid and he was like very upset. But what saved it was like this this guy who was working at the brewery. He was like an intern or something at the time. He invited me for a bottle share afterwards, and like proceeded to pour me every single thing they had on tap, <laughs> shared with me my first rare barrel, which we're gonna have, <laughs> shared with me my, the guard, like all these crazy yeah. beers that I would never have the chance to. And it just goes to show you like, like who you drink with matters more than what you're drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pro ah. tip from the ant, wine and guy, um, if you ever get invited to a bottle share, you go. go. You just go. Just go. <laughs> go get the most expensive bottle of beer you can find at the store, bring it with you, and then you'll have just a great time. And you get a chance to drink things that you won't ever drink again. Yeah. So. I sent him a case of Big Island Brew House to thank him. That's a oh, good that's maneuver. Yeah. Yeah. So the cool thing is like a lot of these beers, so obviously we're drinking um, sour beers, which are sort of on the, the upper echelon of, of sort of the, the the beer culture, right? Um, just because they're really hard to make, because sometimes sour beers can come out tasting like shit. <laughs> like, like they can come out tasting really bad, um, and they're they're not great, right? But when you have ones that are made incredibly well, then it, it comes out fantastic. And then something like Russian River and Consecration, you know, it's incredible. Well, I have to bring it because Russian River was actually like owned by a winery before. Yeah. They were owned by Corbell, right? Corbell Champagne or whatever. So this is the one that they do in 100% Cabernet Sauvignon barrels. So a tie-in for beer. And this is even hard to trick yourself into saying it's a sour because it's so it's not super just, sour. It's and it's 10% alcohol, which it's I would never call. <laughs> right. Yeah, seriously. Well, it's also from, yeah, 2015. I was saving this quite a bit. So it sits in age and rounds out. That's why there's no bubbles, right? No, yeah, the, it loses carbonation in the, in the bottle. But just like champagne as it ages, you know, vintage champagnes will lose their bubbles, mm -hmm. but they start to gain some of that funk. It's a different say, type of carbonation goes out, but it's more flavor comes through, so you 
kind of win. You lose <laughs> yeah. addition by subtraction, you know? Yeah. If you want carbonation, you can drink a Coors. <laughs> <laughs> right. You got champagne of beer right in there. That's true. <laughs> 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 carbonation in my life. <laughs> but that, I mean, again, it goes back to like finding, finding those cool situations where you can find something like totally unexpected that you weren't expecting and it was just like, you know, different flavors. It, was, it went from being one of my worst restaurant experiences ever to, um, to probably the most memorable. Yeah, which is funny because I don't really remember it. So <laughs> you, that's so much to do with the hospitality industry in general. I mean, yeah. you know, that's it, right? you find that your best experiences ever come out of something that is seemingly nothing or was used to be bad, so. Yeah. <laughs> so did you start out as a, a drinking wine? Like, how did you no. progress? Like, what was your progression, right? Like, yeah, no, yeah. So how do you go from that to like all, all of this? Like, cause that's not a big leap. Just, just dumb luck. Just dumb luck. I, I got my first job out of uh, college in Southern Wine and Spirits and then wanted to study about wine because that's where, I don't know, sales and the money was. And I, you know, being this kid from Kauai, you want to prove to somebody like, hey, like, I'm not just country. I, you know, I want to do this elevated stuff. I can, I can compete on the world stage too. Um, and that was my motivation, and now it's not anymore because alcohol is not a competition. It should be fun. Uh, yeah, just dumb luck. It's like Jerry Lopez, you know, Mr. Pipeline. Whoever's having the most fun wins. Uh, yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be more but than that. But I mean, that's one of the greatest lines after you've been bartending so long. You want to tell people it's not a competition. Stop drinking so much. <laughs> there is no finish There's line. No winner. There's, There's no winner. There's no winner. No, nobody wins. What are you saying, DB? Are you, are you serious right now? You win, okay? Fine, you win. Fine, you win. <laughs> Fine, you win. <laughs> I'm the winner. <laughs> All right. Now that we've established that Chris won, we're going to take a short break and we're going to be right back. So come I'm back. I'm going to win the next segment too. <laughs> <laughs> the Art of Beer is brought to you by Value Furniture. Has over 10,000 items from acclaimed designers to make furnishing your home easy. Create something beautiful with value. Beachside Roofing, the leaders. Welcome back to The Art of Beer. We're here with Chris, the host of our Wine and Podcast, and we're about to get into some rare barrel. I'm super excited Can't about wait. this. Well, why don't we jump into some of your buddies' beer? Because that's a big scene, right? Like the homebrewing beer, and that's how a lot of people got into homebrewing. We'll save the rare barrels for the next segment. But we will yeah. drink them. Yeah, right? we're okay. going okay. to drink them. Cool. Right? Cool. 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 Let's jump into your buddies' beer. Yeah, yeah, come on. Definitely. So I'm going to sit this around. You want to pop this yeah. and pour out, I'll start talking. Um, so how, yeah, what, what's the story behind these? So definitely one thing we want to talk, highlight about um, beer making is also homebrew because we're talking to a lot of guys who have been brewing, but we forget that they all started somewhere else and a lot of times they started in their own garage brewing something. Um, this is one that I have that's pretty near and dear to me is a group of my friends that make a beer. Um, it's a pure community spirit. Uh, it's called Trevero's Brewers, Brewers Trevero Brewers. Um, it's a collaboration between friends and it's called the Fistful of Friends because everybody who puts their hands on this product makes the beer and the beer is solely for their friends to drink. You know, they're not selling it to make a profit. They're taking care of the community. They're taking group, care of their group of friends. Um, and oh, it's, it's a homebrew thing, right? Like it's, it's a It's great, thing. yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. That's how a lot of places started, right? Absolutely. Like, so this is how we're starting off. I mean, you think about like the entire like American now, craft brewing I community even, started with homebrewing. Absolutely. So before we, cheers, I was saying the background into it is by Trevero. One of the guys, his last name is Javero, Jared Javero. The other guy, Fraser Gerard, is from New Zealand. And in New Zealand, they say chur. Now chur is like talking, it says like any kind. You know, if they, if, instead of saying the kind like we say here, they say chur. So how's your day, chur? It's a greeting, chur, chur, when you guys are, chur. So, and then I'll, I'll to the beer makers. Say sure, chur. Sure, sure. sure. <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah. So oh, they, that's great. And they shoot for it. Nice, just light blonde ale. Easy drinking. Easy drinking. It's for our friends in a garage. Poopoos are out on the table, hanging out with your best friends. I look at that. That's why it's super appropriate to do it because I'm sitting here with you guys, all great friends. We're sitting beers, we're having snacks. Enjoying our day. So. I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing more fresh than getting homebrew from your buddy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it is like out of his fermenter into a bottle. Like that's a fantastic. Also, and you, the love that goes into it because you know yeah. the people doing it, and you know that they're they're not doing it to pay their rent. This is happening. No you matter think what. about it like that started 
a billion dollar industry yeah. because like guys homebrewing started the entire movement. Like if it wasn't for some guy just going, I'm just gonna brew what I want in my garage. None of, none of all this stuff we have would be available, right? At least in America. Home right? brewing was illegal in America. Yeah, exactly. For right. like since what, until 88 or something like that? Like 78. 78? Yeah. Jimmy Carter. Right? Carter. Was like he, he, he legalized, because before you couldn't home brew. It was illegal. That's crazy. Because of prohibition, yeah. Yeah. I mean, people did. Yeah, people did. <laughs> but, like, but all of a sudden, like, now you could you could make your own stuff at home. And then, then people are like, I'm going to do whatever I want, you know? And that was that was the, the age of exploration, you know? And, and without that, where would we be, you know? And so, like, it's, and it's still happening, what, 40 years later? And I think a lot of the, the homebrewing rad. scene here in Hawaii definitely boomed because people were trying to get, you know, hoppy beers were coming around on the mainland. And you couldn't get them here, or if you could get them here, they were old enough that you stopped tasting oh, that yeah. freshness of the, of the hops and those styles of beers. So people just made those beers so they could have, you know, they'd make clones of their favorite beers, or they would make their own versions of those beers to try to get something that they wanted that they couldn't. The freshest possible thing. I mean, this was bottled eight days ago. <laughs> yeah, so. I could I could hold off on rare barrel for that. That's some, that's some good so, stuff. But well, that's definitely something we want to highlight. And the fact that they put on, the name of the beer is Fistful of Friends. It just puts. It just shows that everybody had their hands in it going around, and it's something uh, we've been talking about collaborations a lot on different shows, and just that is a collaboration. And it's this one is more heartfelt. There's no money involved in it. It's just this drinking is a, beer with the boys. It's a glass full of aloha for sure, yeah. right? It is about collab. I mean, even the home brewers would share their exact recipes, right? Yeah, I've right. never. I mean, I'm, a wine, I'm around the wine community. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like you know, I've never seen a more like gracious group of human beings than beer people. I mean, the bartenders are pretty close, but. And with that, we're going to head over to our extended edition. We want to thank Chris Ramel, host of Wine and Podcast, for bringing us and definitely spoiling us. Oh, yes. Cheers to you, and I can't wait for the extended edition. We finally get into these rare barrel, both of them. Cheers, Cheers, Cheers guys. Right on, welcome back to the extended version of the Art of Beer with Chris Ramel. And we're gonna finally crack open these rare barrels. Yes. Okay. Let's, let's bust them both open. Why not, right? Yeah. Why so not? how'd you come about your bottle? Cause I got my, like I brought a bottle, you brought a bottle. How we, how, you gotta tell a story how you got that bottle. Oh, this one's not as interesting. No, it's not about it. Oh, I, I, I signed up. Yes, I yeah. did too, right? Like For the ambassadors how I program, yes. like we, you know. But like that's the kind where you're refreshing your, your page like yep. every single five seconds. You're like, can I can I get it? Can I get it? Can I get it? And five years later, <laughs> you know, I finally got on the list. So that's another thing. It's like it's cool. I mean, you know, it's it's part of the beer culture where there's breweries that just you know you know, they don't make a ton of stuff, right? And you have to sign up to get their beers, and it's sort of it's kind of an exclusive club in a way yeah if you if you really really want it I um, mean Berkeley's close enough to San Francisco too that it's yeah like, you know make make an excuse to go down there every year yeah they hold beer for you and stuff so wait why are these beers so rare why are these beers so oh it's in the name Dave oh my god <laughs> <It's rare. laughs> I don't know Tim can tell us so the rare barrel I mean what's cool about the rare barrel and and, and it's you know a lot of the breweries in the, in, in the country is like they he said at some point, like, we're going to make a sour base brewery. And what they're initially were focused on making all sour beers. Um, and the rare barrel was named after a, a, an ex, like kind of an elusive barrel that started off at New Belgium Brewery Company. And it started circling and it kind of got lost, right? It was this one barrel that was made really good beer because a lot of sour beers aged in wood barrels. So the, the Dre Fontaine and the Cantillons, they're all aged in wood, just like wine. This one barrel kind of got lost in the mix and ended up in different places. And that's what they named the brewery after. And it, and it was cool because at some point later on that barrel got found and it actually ended up at the rare barrel and they brewed a beer and they made a, in a project with, the, with um, New Belgium and Lauren um, from New Belgium and they made this beer and it was really rad, you know, but it's, it's again, it's like this, there's a lot of knowledge that goes around, right? And it's, there's, Belgian brewers are secretive, but they're also, they love to like share things, but they don't share everything. Like I want to share. They give you 90%. Eat 90%, <laughs> the rest of it you got to figure out, right? You know, and, and that's the cool part, right? Where it's like, it's experimentation. It's like, and what works 
in Berkeley, California might not work in Brussels mm -hmm. or might not work in Kansas City or wherever, right? Like, cause there's, there's incredible breweries and sour breweries, like you think of New Belgium, right? That's in Colorado, right? They were the original American, like kind of sour beer company. Right, yeah. You know, they were doing stuff. La Folie and Le Terroir, yeah. like those are they set, they set years the, ahead of it. Sure, yeah. Before Americans had the taste for sour beer, they were cranking it out. You know? I mean, it wasn't a thing. Right, can I back up just real quick for our audience? Because one of the things that's interesting about those barrels is that they trap yeasts, and those yeasts produce flavors. And that's everything that happens in wine, beer, um, everything before you distill. So those flavors matter. So that whatever was happening in that barrel is what was exciting. You know, yeah. For the brewers, they were getting flavors. And so there's some barrels barrel, that are great, and there's some barrels that are not so great. Not so great, right? right. I mean, because some barrels have good, good, like sort of funky stuff, and and that's why these beers are a little bit more expensive, right? Because mm -hmm. you're you're not going to make one barrel. You're going to make 50 barrels and blend something, yeah. or you're going to make 50 barrels and blend 46 barrels. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're waiting two years for those things to come to fruition before, and then at some point you start tasting things. You're like, that's just not gonna be good beer. That's not gonna happen. So. Does the same thing happen in the wine world where it's like, there's sort of like a, there's a lot of dump or do they figure out a way to repurpose the stuff that maybe in a barrel that didn't Yeah, they work? sell it off to big producers <laughs> and they don't put their family name on it. And that's cool too, you know, because like there's a lot of wine drinkers now. Yeah. So and pe people can't afford, like I can't afford to drink rare barrel every single day, you know, but I drink every single day. Why so, do you think I'm friends with you? <laughs> 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 Shit, are we friends? Oh. <laughs> You're sharing rare barrel with them. So I, say I, yes. don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this, this stuff is, is great. I mean, who would have thought to vintage date beer too? Right, like that seems like such a foreign concept 30 years ago. But I like, I like these with a little bit of age on them because they're so acidic. They're so like, in its youth, they're really aggressive. Um, and you'll see like, they're not, clean like Cantillon and Dre, right? They're like, there's other stuff to it. Like there's what, vanilla and pear and yes. orange and boys and So like, they can do that. They can experiment with this kind of stuff in America. Whereas we're in not Belgium, gonna kill them for us. Yeah, in Belgium is like, no, why, why would you ever put yeah, vanilla well, beans? Don't do that. Yeah, don't do it that. It wouldn't that. sell, that's why. Because if you deviated from the norm, <laughs> they're right. not gonna buy it. Right. But I like In it. America, like we put born on dates to beer because we want it to taste exactly the same all the time. And in the you know in that old world style you're looking for you're looking for that thing that's going to change over time and develop. Well, even like in, in Belgium, you know, there's there's other there's other lambic producers where you know there's traditional fruits, and they're like, why would I ever put peach? We don't put peach in fruits in in our in our in our beers. Whereas the younger generation is like, why not put peach? But it's it's sort of a generational thing sometimes where it's tradition. They only put like raspberries. Frambois and cherries, creek. And that was it. Like, but why would you ever put pesh? I think that's what helped the, Ameri the American <laughs> beer scene because in you know America they're like, well, why not? Let's try it. Let's find it. out. You know, right. there was no no strict rules no. on flavoring. <laughs> yeah. and what we always did because why not? Fuck it. Why not? Why it's not? Just, <laughs> let's try it. If it I've sucks, never, we'll try something different. Like I mean, I've never had a bad beer from Rare Barrel. Like different. I, the way I put it is like great musicians playing the best instruments in the best venue, but just not my genre. Yes. Like I'm not really into dance hall, you know? I'm not really into techno, but like, with that said, I've never had a poorly made beer from them. It's just not my favorite style to drink. But I buy it all because I want to support them. I want them to keep making rad shit. So you that want, I can And you want to share it with us. And I want to <laughs> share it with you. And I want to share it with you. Yeah, we got to go back actually. I'm going, yeah. You got to give me a call. I'm picking up some more. I'm down. Let me know where you're going. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say, I'll go with you. But that's the cool thing. I mean, even with, with wine, like wine, oh, I feel like wine's like, we get a lot, like distribution to Hawaii, right? Yeah. Like there's a lot coming in. And, 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 and beer's caught up in, in a certain sense, but still in the beer culture, it's you travel. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's still like a really unique thing. We're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there because that brewery is there and I can't get and I don't know if, does that exist like with the wine world where like people, are people bringing back like suitcases of wine? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we did. You know, it's funny because I think that the roles have been reversed. Before you couldn't get any beer here. Yeah. And now I think like beer hasn't just caught up to wine. I think it's surpassed it. Really? I really do. Don't you I have really a do. wine podcast? 
<laughs> I do. Are we still? Aren't, aren't you <laughs> First off, I don't think we're renewed for the next season. So. Uh, we might not be either. <laughs> <laughs> Let's drink. Let's drink, boy. It's on editing. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, thanks to you, thanks to a lot of these other distributors, like, we have some really cool stuff. Before I had to mule over Cascade and, like, I don't know, like, a bunch of these things. Dogfish Head? There's yeah. no way in hell you could get Dogfish Head. Even stuff like Stone. Yeah. You know, like, so I, I think can beer has caught up. So 10 years ago, you searched for it. I think beer has surpassed it. Like, I, 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 will, I would disagree with that in terms of the travel thing, because I think, you know, we talk about if it grows together, it goes together. And I think mm -hmm. when you go to those places, you go to, we, we went to Belgium and, and you're yeah. eating Southern Belgian food with Orval and it just makes sense. If you're in Southern Germany and you're eating, you know, white sausage and Iger. Yeah, oh. like, like a, it's it just a vice, goes to get ice beer. <laughs> yeah, vice beer for breakfast. I never thought was a thing until I went to Germany. I was like, it's absolutely the thing, yeah. you know. And and then you go to England and you're eating fish and chips with English ales, and it just makes sense. And so um, that that if it's not terroir necessarily in the beer because of the water or the land or whatever, there's terroir in that experience. And you come back and we we taught you about Orval, right? Because we had such a great experience, and. And now it's my favorite. <laughs> and it's such, a, and it's made the same way this champagne is, you know. And so it develops that texture and those yeah. those flavors and those things because of it. But it also makes sense in that location. And in America, there's so much experimentation. Like, yeah. you have to go to those breweries because, you know, so many breweries that we are f are focusing on here locally or we, or we go to visit. Those beers are made once, you know. So if you want to have that beer, the only way to have it is there's only the brewery, seven yeah. barrels of it. Like yeah. that's it. And once it's power, it's power. And so. And we always touch on the freshness of it. I mean. Right. If it's in Oregon, do we want to wait a couple of weeks <laughs> on a Madsen container and until it goes somewhere to be done? But you go to the brewery at the spot, it's that in all its glory, you know, fresh as possible. For sure. And I think there's something about wineries too, you know, like there's, there is a culture in Northern California that is a, surrounds that whole wine making region. And there's a, you go to Corvallis or mm -hmm. Willamette, you know, there's a culture of what's happening with the, the brewery, the chefs and the distillers and the breweries and the wineries are all kind of building a culture together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you go there and you have that rad experience, like you want to buy a case of that right. wine or you want to get on their mailing list yes. so they send you wine every you know, two months or whatever it is. And you want to have those, share those really cool experiences that you had there with your friends back here and, and they become a different experience altogether once you incorporate that into your... And then you your bring it back and you're like, shit, it's not as good as when I had it there. <laughs> Sometimes it is. Drink, <laughs> drink your rare man. <laughs> <laughs> but I, that was the point I'm trying to make is that it like really, because it, I'm not advocating for no travel. Travel, go to go see these great breweries and go see these great wineries and have that experience. But like, it usually tastes way better when you're there. Because it's like you're in the very place that created it, right? You're endorphins. You, right. <laughs> and you're, you're on vacation. You're usually with somebody that you love. And your palate's not shot. <laughs> well, that's fair. It's not endorphins. But, that's <laughs> but then you bring it home and it's like, it's just, it's the same for the most part. But it's not the same. And what I wanted to say about these things, everything that I opened today, um, they taste better because I'm having them with friends. Yeah. And they evoke a memory, you know, like, and that's, and that's a big thing, I think even for people who are traveling to Hawaii and when they go back to where they're from, it's like, you know, I mean, you know, if you're gonna have a certain beer from Hawaii that you might be able to find in another state, it might not be like the best beer you ever had, but it's about, again, it's about mm -hmm. who you're having it with, what it, re what it invokes, like how the feeling is, right? And the situation, like what are you, are you cruising around? If you're, if you're sitting in the dead of winter and you're sharing beers from a certain locale with, certain stuff on the table like yeah it's a perfect then that's the whole point of it right mm -hmm. like you're it's who you're with not necessarily like always like how perfectly made it is the the, yeah. the people around you heavily influence your experience i would oh, say yeah. that's most of the thing i mean yeah. just yeah, I, yeah, we, we could be anywhere and the weather could be terrible and mm -hmm. we'd be sitting outside but if we're with the right group of people you still have a great time the beer still tastes good, and you always remember that. I love that we're all echoing the same sentiment, because this is coming from people with supposedly decent palates. Why do you look at me? <laughs> supposedly <laughs> decent palates? <laughs> or, or you can live like where we live, or we're like lucky, where you go down the street, like right now, it's like you go down the street to Alamana Beach Park, and it's paradise for anybody else in the country. Mm -hmm. 
they would kill to have that at their disposal. And we could go down there and crack a beer right now and just chill. Yeah. And, it, and it's the most beautiful setting in probably the entire country right now. People spend their whole stimulus to come to, to come here yeah. to hang out at And we could do that whenever we want 12 months a year. But not drink there, right? Wink, wink. Not, not drink there. We're so not allowed to drink. Small small cups, small cups. <laughs> not yet. All the police that watch this podcast and be like, they're going to see Tim by the beach. And no police are watching this podcast. <laughs> this guy's <laughs> drinking, guaranteed. They, yeah. they won't remember us. But that's the other thing. About, like, I mean, again, it's like, you know, that's, that's a culture here where it's like, you don't, like, we don't have a pub drinking culture here, right? Because why? Like, why do you yeah. want to drink inside here? Take beers to the beach. Yeah, yeah, take it to the beach park and all that stuff. And I'm not saying like, and it's responsibly, but still like, it's not cold and wet and dark and stormy and all that. I mean, it's beautiful outside. Like, why not drink where, like, and it's, and it's not about just drinking. It's about hanging out with people that you enjoy and conversing and maybe having arguments conversations right like that's a good thing right like arguments and, sometimes yes but it's, but it's like that's the thing that's lost right like yeah, we don't yeah. have those conversations where it's like yeah you should be talking about stuff like that because yeah. it's important right and we've we've kind of sort of gone away from that but it's that's what it's for right you know and it's like yeah you might get not agree all the time but, but that's good. the best thing about beer right like it's it doesn't matter what the situation is you know you can be at the beach park you can be at a bottle share you can be hanging out with friends you know, you can have this, the most epic day of surf and you paddle until your arms don't work. And you sit there and you're, you're just, you can't leave the beach because you're staring at like, the <laughs> best beauty. surf day of your life. Yeah, exactly. And you can barely really, lift the beer to your lips. when you're really, really <laughs> tired, that's the best beer you that's ever the best tasted. Yeah. <laughs> that's the best and that, one. It doesn't matter it what it is. It can be post-mountain run, or <laughs> a trail run, or surf session, or work, or whatever it is. But yeah, beer's, beer's the constant in all those. Oh, yeah. But it's a, and it's a communal thing, right? Like, it's just cruising hanging out, whether it's something as, you know, high end as this or not, right? Like it doesn't matter. And I think that's like a cool, super cool thing. Like why not, right? Do you have an aha beer? Why not? Did I ask you this already? Do you have like the my, beer that like, my oh aha my God, beer? what is this? Like I got to know more about this kind of stuff. Fat tire. I was in college. I always drank. Fat Tire wasn't available in, in Hawaii when I was, in, you know. Yeah. So I was in high school drinking light beers or whatever you could get. And I went to Arizona for college and first place I ever went after, you know, well, Fat Tire turned 21. <laughs> Bar on draft, Fat Tire. And I drank it and I was like, holy shit, what is this? Like, it was just fascinated. I drank it probably every day for months, you know, and then that's what made me look look down the taps now. Yeah, like what you know, I used to look at the taps and be like, where's the Coors Light, oh, Miller Light, sure, whatever. But now, that I had that aha. And I started looking at the different taps. I started asking questions, I started tasting things. So I can pinpoint mine to Fat Tire. You got one, dude? I remember the beer that changed me from, uh, Sam Adams is the beer that changed me from being a, a light beer drinker to a drinker. I don't remember what moment I had like, and then it, it, that was a quest, right? Like we worked together. I sold beer for three and a half years. <laughs> some of the best beer on the planet. And at some point I realized it wasn't about the beer. Like it was really about these moments of sitting around talking to people. And I don't remember what beer it was. I don't remember who, actually I don't even remember who it was, but there was a moment where it shifted in my head from being about what's in the glass to who's sitting at the table. You? Of course I What do you expect, bro? Silver bullet? I, I don't know I don't know how to answer that. It's blue I, mountains, man. That's yeah. <laughs> they're blue. Come on. Every I mean I, I really don't know. Everything. It was always like it was always about the people for me too. Because we didn't grow up with good things ever. <laughs> like it, it took me a long time to get good things. You guys had the short end of the stick over there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Heineken and Crown, baby. And that was our expensive stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That was like, yeah. Still the two best selling things on this island. <laughs> it's, it's unreal. They, they locked the crown up at the grocery store. <laughs> but it, you know, like for me, it took, it took me like going away. And then, you know, I like trying some different stuff. My, my, my brother used to give me like dead guy. 
And I was like, oh, what, what is it? Like, wait, wait, that doesn't look like beer. That might have been it for me too. Can I just bite your style? Yeah, that, no. that might have been it for <laughs> me too. But you know, too. but like for I a swear. lot of people in Hawaii, because Dead yeah. Guy was available, yes, right? Yes, it was. It was available and it was at Manoa Gardens. Yes. You can get, a <laughs> <laughs> you can get the 32 ounce yes. for 625. Before yeah. your night Got class. It. Yeah. <laughs> you throw the bartender in there a 10. Yeah. So you tip fat and you like you felt like the man. Yeah. And, and then you felt hammered. 625. 8.7%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that and Cezanne Dupont. Remember, yeah. I remember moving to the mainland and having a Cezanne Dupont. I'm like, what on earth is this? Yeah. <laughs> and then it was a spiral down. The, you know. We could do a whole episode on Cezanne Dupont. Oh, yeah. But that's what I was say. We, we got an hour about Cezanne Dupont. <laughs> <laughs> But it's also like what's available to you, right? Like what, you know, we just, you know, I was, yeah, yeah, we had Sam Adams, Sierra Nevada, and Rogue. Once you get the bug, you're like, you're in. I mean, I didn't even know, growing up in Kauai, it's so weird. Like, we really need to do a better job teaching these kids coming up here. Like, alcohol is a viable career choice. <laughs> you know, like, how is that? Had I known that when I was growing up, I'd be a master when I was 21. You know, like, it, like, oh, I'd still be bartending. Why do we like, <laughs> why do we treat like the hospitality yeah. industry as something that it's, it's something you do before your big break? You know, like, it's we, not just a college job. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, you can make an uh, actual career out of it, you know, and I think like, not us in particular, but there is some sort of, we're doing these kids a disservice to where they don't know that food and beverage is actually like a viable career choice. Like you have a business out of it. You know, like it's, yeah, had I known that kind of stuff and like if we just, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating like, hey, let's go to, let's go to the high school let's and get drink, all these kids right? drunk. Yeah, yeah. Like we just, we should, you know, there should but be it's pride in the hospital. Learning the college, get them drunk. We can get them the college. I think the, bigger, the bigger thing is like learning how, it's, it's, it's things that I, I'm not sure that kids are learning now, but it's like learning how to talk to people, learning how to mm -hmm. remember people is like just, Hey, it's communication, right? How, how to deal with how disappointment. How to network not on a phone. How yeah. to talk to people. Talk to someone. And relate. Create your web through personal Because that personal person to person conversation is so important. And that's what everything we talk about right here. It's like hanging out, talking. Like, and it's not necessarily about always what you're drinking. It's about who you're drinking it with and what you're talking about, right? Your problems, you know, like the joys, the 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 bad things in your life, right? And that's, that's what people need to do more, right? And I think sometimes, you know, that's lost and everything, right? Like, you know, you get out, they just talk to people. But sometimes if you're- And then sometimes you have rare barrel in your class and it is about the beer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it all better. Sometimes I have rare barrel and I don't want to talk to anyone. <laughs> it's like, hey, you shut up, stop, stop talking to me. Yeah. Stop talking and enjoy. <laughs> Oh, Dave's here. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, on that note, we are going to end this episode. This is an amazing beer. Thank, Thank you, you for so joining much. Us. Thank you guys for sharing these beers. The best okay. Thank you. talk ever. Thank you for being here. Sure.